Day 33 of Heart Dive 365. I'm your Bible study friend, Kanoi. Welcome to the Heart Dive Podcast. Welcome back, friends. We are in Exodus chapters 10 through 12 today, where we will finish out the plagues, the final plague upon Egypt. But before we get into it, we do have a couple of things to deal with for business. First of all, if you have downloaded the Heart Check bundles, please make sure that you watch Holly's video, which she worked very hard on either in the email or on our website to make sure that you are downloading them properly. And also just a heads up, if you downloaded the month of February for the future, you're not going to receive any heart checks until they are uploaded by Holly every single day, because of course we don't have any heart checks available yet for the future in February. Also, just wanted to talk about something that we discussed yesterday because this is Bible study and we have discussions and because it came up in the comments quite a few times, some people were bothered by the discussion that we had about the theory that presented the Nile turning to blood being a metaphor and the fact that it could have possibly actually been been uh, torrential rains that brought in this soil and brought in the algae that turned it to the color red. And some people were saying, nope, if God said it's blood, it's blood. That very well could be. And I'm going to go with that as well. But what scholars have done is they look at every single little angle and they looked at the progression of the plagues and they looked at the fact that the first nine plagues were all natural events, of course, with God's hand being upon them to have them hypernaturally or supernaturally happen. And so turning into literal blood would not have fallen in line with that natural occurrence. However, when they presented this idea, it wasn't to try to prove God to be a liar. It wasn't to try to take away his power or to say that there's no way God could turn water into blood because we all know that he could. And he again may possibly have done so. But they're looking at it from the perspective that blood was a metaphor because we know in the Bible that God uses metaphors all over the place. And he uses metaphors as a literary element. Typically when he uses them, it's to add emphasis or to try to describe something something in a different way, the same way that Jesus would speak in parables. I mean, when Jesus says that he's the bread of life, he isn't literally saying, I'm a loaf of bread and I need you to eat my flesh and drink my blood. No, it was symbolic. Same way when he says he's the salt of the earth, the light of the world, or he is the vine and we are the branches, or the father is the potter and we are the clay. I mean, these things are not literal. We have to look at the metaphorical meaning behind them. And so that is where that idea came from. So again, we were not calling God a liar. We weren't saying he didn't have the power and we were not trying to put him into a box. In fact, quite the opposite. Whenever we look at things that way, it actually expands my mind into the power of God and the way that he does things. So if you're still going with, nope, it was blood and that's the way that it is, that's awesome. I agree with you. But I'm also open to believing that it could have possibly been a metaphor as well. And that's why I brought it up for discussion because that's what we do in Bible study. We discuss things and we do so lovingly. So I just wanted to bring that up because again, quite a few comments about that one and I didn't want people to walk away bothered from that. And I wanted you to know my heart. And just a heads up, we are using the ESV translation by Crossway, if anybody is interested in what translation we read from. Otherwise, let's go ahead and pray and jump into the Word. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to wake up today. We are so grateful, Lord, for another day to be able to breathe in your air, your peace, your joy, your goodness, and your mercy. Thank you for your mercies that are new to us every single day. What a joy it is to be able to wake up and say, it's a brand new day. I'm going to be different today. I'm going to be better today than I was yesterday. We want to do that, Lord, because we want to be more like you. We want to be changed from glory to glory. So that doesn't mean going backwards. It means moving forward with you. Forgive us, Lord, where we haven't done so. Forgive us where we have been out of step with everything that you've called us to do and be. So I pray today as we come into your word, Lord, that you will open up our ears to hear your voice specifically. We know that every time we read in obedience, God, you want to speak to us. So with our two ears, Lord, may we be open to hearing you more than we are trying to think or even speak. But I pray that our eyes also will be opened and peeled upon your word to see you, God, in it, to see your heartbeat, to see the way that you intended for these words words to be interpreted. May we not do so in error, God, but I pray that you will help us to have the faith to believe every single word that we read as truth. And also, please allow our hearts to be open and may they be good soil for when the seeds are planted, Lord, you will be able to water them and nourish them and allow them to flourish and bear 
fruit. So we thank you for this time. Please forgive us of our sins. God, wash us clean today as white as snow and help us to forgive others as well. We love you so much in Jesus name. Amen. One more note that I forgot to tell you guys about, I actually downloaded and printed out the Exodus Bible Project poster, which I have put the link in the description box. These will not be in my notes, but the link will be there for you to be able to download. There's also an Old Testament one, which is really great. And you will also see in my notes today, the 10 plagues and the Egyptian gods that actually correlated with each one of these plagues. And of course, we know that God, and he will say it today, brings judgment upon the Egyptian gods. And so these are the different ones. I thought it was interesting. And so I believe I pulled this from either the Rose Chronological Guide to the Bible or the Rose Book of Bible Charts, Maps, and Timelines. So to make sure I'm maintaining my copyright integrity, I did not include that in today's notes, but there's a picture copy, a very small one that you will see in my Bible today. But if you want to get the large copy of that, that's in those books, those linked in the Amazon link below. So we left off on the seventh plague, Pharaoh hardening his heart once again. So here we begin in chapter 10 on the eighth plague. Then the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may show these signs of mine among them, and that you may tell in the hearing of your son and your grandson how I have dealt harshly with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them, that you may know that I am the Lord." So here we see that God has intended from the very beginning for the accounts of his great deliverance to be carried from generation to generation. And they would do so typically orally. I mean, they would tell their children and he always has a greater purpose beyond just us. And that intention still remains today. I mean, we all have a testimony and of course the great commission being go and tell and particularly tell your children what God has done for you. So heart check. What does your deliverance story look like? Where has God moved in power in your life? And are you telling it to others? Verse three, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and said to him, thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? So all of this is rooted in Pharaoh's pride. Let my people go that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your country, and they shall cover the face of the land so that no one can see the land. And they shall eat what is left to you after the hail, and they shall eat of every tree of yours that grows in the field. And they shall fill your houses and the houses of all your servants and of all the Egyptians, as neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen from the day they came on the earth to this day. Then he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Now, someone asked the question, wasn't there only a day in between the plagues? Well, this goes to show that there wasn't unless God supernaturally brought up all the plants again after the hail. But if we're looking at nature taking its course, some time would have had to have passed to allow these plants to regrow so that the locusts could then come back in and destroy them. Verse seven, then Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long shall this man be a snare to us? Now this word snare actually translates to be a trap for birds. That is what a snare is. Well, here, it is a symbol of destruction. And the fact that his servants are acknowledging God and his power, and they know that he's the reason for their destruction, it fulfills what God had said about the fact that the Egyptians would acknowledge him and his power. So they continue, let the men go that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not yet understand that Egypt is ruined? And I found it amazing that they're able to speak to Pharaoh like this, but okay. So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh and he said to them, go serve the Lord, your God, but which ones are to go? (laughs) So he's like, you can go, but you can't. Moses said, we will go with our young and our old. We will go with our sons and daughters and with our flocks and herds, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. But he said to them, the Lord be with you. If ever I let you and your little ones go, look, you have some evil purpose in mind. No, go the men among you and serve the Lord for that is what you are asking. So he heard his servants say, let the men go. But here he is saying, yeah, you asked, let only the men go. And they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. Why does he not want the women, children, and livestock to go? Because he wants to assure that the men are going to return and get back to work the way they were before. Verse 12, then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts so that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every plant in the land, all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. 
When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locust. The locust came up over the land of Egypt and settled on the whole country of Egypt. Such a dense swarm of locusts as had never been before, nor ever will be again. So this was an unprecedented locust swarm that came into the land, and they would never see this at least until the point that this was written. And I know we have seen huge destruction on crops by swarms of locusts, but I don't know that it was ever to this degree since then. They covered the face of the whole land so that the land was darkened, and they ate all the plants in the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Not a green thing remained, neither tree nor plant of the field, through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hastily called Moses and Aaron and said, "'I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you.' Now, therefore, forgive my sin, please, only this once, and plead with the Lord your God only to remove this death from me. So once again, we see the shallow repentance of Pharaoh. So he went out from Pharaoh and pleaded with the Lord. And the Lord turned the wind into a very strong west wind, so opposite of the east wind that brought in the locusts, which lifted the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not a single locust was left in all the country of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the people of Israel go. Verse 21, Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and there was a pitch darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. So this word pitch darkness, this is kind of like saying darkness, darkness. The first darkness would have been that common darkness, like when you turn off the lights and there's darkness. But the second darkness, the emphatic word would be to show that this is a deep gloom. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days. But all the people of Israel had light where they lived. So this darkness, again, was not just related to the visual or the optical senses. This darkness was one that could be felt to their innermost being. And remember, the Egyptians worshipped the sun god Ra, so this would have been the biggest blow to their spirits, putting everyone in a depression of sorts. I mean, it says here, no one could even get up for three days. And this brings to mind also the darkness that covers the earth for three days between Jesus's death and his resurrection. You see, all hope seemed to be lost whenever the light of the world was put to death. But it was necessary for his light to eternally shine upon those who love him and seek him. And that light should really project in every area of our lives. Just as there was light on the homes of the Israelites, his presence and his light should also fill the rooms in our homes as well. So heart check, are the lights on in your home? Is there prayer and devotion? Are the words being spoken ones of love and grace? Verse 24, then Pharaoh called Moses and said, go serve the Lord. Your little ones also may go with you. So he's starting to relent here, little. Only let your flocks and your herds remain behind. So still some compromise required. But Moses said, you must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Our livestock also must go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind for we must take them to serve the Lord our God. And we do not know with what we must serve the Lord until we arrive arrive there. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, get away from me. Take care never to see my face again, for on the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moses said, as you say, I will not see your face again. Now there will come a point where they will not see each other's faces again, but it will actually be Pharaoh who is the one to die. Chapter 11. Now the Lord said to Moses, yet one plague more I will bring upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. And when he lets you go, he will drive you away completely. Speak now in the hearing of the people that they ask every man of his neighbor and every woman of her neighbor for silver and gold jewelry. So basically telling the Israelites to go to the Egyptians and ask for silver and gold. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man of Moses was very great in the land of Egypt, in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So it seems as though the people are not really respecting Pharaoh too much anymore. I mean, they are over it. And so they're even looking at the Israelites and as Moses to be in a respected position. And that's why they're willing to just give them all of these items of silver and gold. Now, as much as we live out our faith, knowing that 
God doesn't owe us anything, we could still see His goodness and the fact that He is just, and He will get us paid whenever there is payment due. You remember that the Egyptians were overworking the Israelites and most definitely were not paying them what they deserved. But here we see God in His justice, giving the Israelites favor in the eyes of the Egyptians, and they're doling out this silver and gold before they leave. So heart check, Do you ever feel undervalued or underpaid? Do you trust that God will one day get you paid back? I believe it. Verse four, so Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I will go out in the midst of Egypt and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill and all the firstborn of the cattle. So when he is saying one who sits on the throne to the slave girl, these would have been social opposites, which is his way of saying In totality, no one is going to escape from the poorest to the richest and even the livestock. And we're not just talking babies here. I mean, this is the firstborn. So if there is a firstborn in the home that is 40 years old, his life is going to be taken. Verse six, there shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been nor ever will be again. But not a dog shall growl against any of the people of Israel, either man or beast, that you may know that the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. So God here obviously protecting and separating his people in his sovereignty. And all these your servants shall come down to me and bow down to me saying, get out you and all the people who follow you. And after that, I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. And I had to read this a couple times saying, wait, who's angry? Whoa, why is Moses angry? angry. Is he angry at the fact that Pharaoh has not relented and he is upset that he is going to have to tell him that this is going to happen? I mean, if anyone were going to anyone, no matter who they are and saying all your babies are about to die or your children or your firstborn, that is not a pleasant thing to have to say to somebody, no matter how evil they are, because the babies aren't the ones who are at fault here. So that was my thinking behind it. I don't know. What are your thoughts? Why do you think Moses was so angry? Verse nine, then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you that my wonders may be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron did all these wonders before Pharaoh and the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart and he did not let the people of Israel go out of his land. So God has warned what is going to happen here in chapter 11 and we're going to see it take place in chapter 12. So here's the section that speaks of the Passover and Passover actually means to spare or to skip. Verse one, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. So here we see God doing a switcheroo in the calendar. This month was originally known as Abib between the months of April and May. So now God is saying, nope, this is going to now be the first month. We're changing the calendar and it will be known as Nisan. So Nisan now in April and May, according to our calendar, is the first month of the Jewish calendar. Now we will see in Daniel chapter seven that the Antichrist is also going to try to change the calendar once again. So he will do so to completely remove Jesus from the equation. And we're already seeing a hint at this because what was once known as AD and BC, so before Christ and Anno Domini, which means year of our Lord, doesn't mean after death, like I always thought as a kid, it is now being changed to CE and BCE, meaning common era or before common era. Now, I don't know a lot about the meaning of that, but I was watching a Christian video the other day and he was referring to dates in the Bible and he was using that terminology. BCE and CE. And I was kind of taken aback because I was like, wait a minute, is that not the worldly view of these distinctions in time? I don't know. Does anybody know more about that? Like, was that something that the world changed or was that something that we did biblically? I'm still sticking to AD and BC and I think I always will, especially when it comes to my personal life, because I'm like, you know what? I know how I was in my BC days before Christ, and there better be a big old difference in my AD days. So what about you? Is there a distinction in your personal calendar? What do your BC days look like compared to now? What were you like before Christ? All right, 
Verse three, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. So in Genesis chapter four, we saw that a lamb would be the sacrifice for one man. Now we're seeing the lamb being a sacrifice for an entire family or household. In chapter 29, we will see it expanded even further to the lamb being a sacrifice for a nation. And then in John chapter one, of course, Jesus, our Passover lamb, will be the sacrifice for the entire world. And we will see that in 1 Corinthians chapter five, where Jesus is declared the Passover lamb. So as we read this chapter, keep your eyes peeled for Jesus and the significance of the Passover to his death. Verse four, and if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. So here we are seeing Jesus fulfilling that. Of course, he was blameless, without blemish, no sin. He was a male. And this year old can be translated of the first year or even to firstborn. Now, notice that it went from speaking of a lamb to the lamb to your lamb. And again, progression of Jesus. He was a lamb to be sacrificed, became the lamb that sacrificed himself for the entire world and who then became our perfect sacrifice. I mean, we were the ones who deserved to be there. He took our place. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. So taking a look at the significance of this, recapping here, the lamb would be selected on the 10th day of that first month. Now, Jesus actually went into Jerusalem on the 10th day of the first month of AD 32. And it was during those next four days before he was crucified that the Sadducees and the Pharisees were trying everything they could to find a spot, to find a blemish, to try to discredit him or find fault in his theology, but yet he was blameless. And it's the same way that on the 14th day is when this lamb will be sacrificed at twilight. Why? They are allowing those four days to go by to make sure that this lamb is actually spotless without blemish and does not have any disease. And it just blows my mind that we see Jesus all over this, yet the Jewish people still deny Jesus being the Messiah. And we'll continue to see it here in the Feast of the Passover, verse 7. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. So this would be the top part of the doorpost, the lintel. They shall eat of the flesh that night. And of course, we hear about eating of Jesus's body in John chapter six, it shall be roasted on the fire, which could be symbolic of the cross with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. And they still, the Jewish people hold the Passover feast today and they serve it this way. There are other regulations that go along with it, but the bitter herbs that they serve are symbolic of the slavery that took place in Egypt. And they typically use horseradish nowadays from what I read. And this unleavened bread would be the matzah or the matzah balls. And it's interesting even with that, because I went down a whole rabbit hole of looking into the feast of how they celebrate the Passover today. And even the matzah balls are symbolic of Jesus. I mean, there's so many different things and that's going to have to be a whole nother video, but it's interesting. If you're willing to go take a look, I would. It's, it's pretty neat to see how Jesus is infused even in today's Passover feast, yet they fail to see it. I mean, they even poke the matzo, they, they put stripes in it. So that is symbolic of Jesus' side being pierced and the stripes on his back and all of these things. And there's even a sign of the Trinity. It's just amazing. So that's how he tells them they shall eat it. Verse nine, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. So in other words, no leftovers, do not leave anything else. And that is symbolic of the fact that when Jesus went to the cross, it was completed. Everything was finished. There is nothing that could not be covered by his blood. So every sin that we would commit, past, present, future has been taken to the cross, nailed to the cross, and it will be thrown into the fire and burnt to chaff. Verse 11, in this manner, you shall eat it with your belts fastened, your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. 
So eating the Passover meal with their belts fastened and their sandals on their feet, this displays their readiness to go. And Jesus speaks about this with the parable of the bridegroom and the 10 virgins, who the five of them who left their lamps filled with oil were the ones who were allowed into the wedding banquet. And we don't know when our time on earth will come to an end, but my prayer is that I'm ready when it does. So what about you? Is your belt fastened and are your sandals on? If the Lord showed up today, would you be ready to go? So he continues to tell them, and you shall eat in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night. And this passing through is a horizontal passing. And it's the same Hebrew word that relates to the actual word Hebrew, which means to cross over. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. So he is telling them, I'm the one doing this, nobody else. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. So remember that a sign is either a reminder, a memorial, or a symbol, or a miracle of God's power. I see both of these, but scholars say this is going to serve as more of that memorial or symbol on their doorpost to allow God to know that when He passes over, they are not to be touched. They are the children of God who are to be protected from this plague. And this is what will differentiate them from the Egyptians. It's the blood. The same way that the blood of Jesus is the only thing that differentiates us from the world. That is what sets us apart. We cannot be saved any other way. We can't get to heaven any other way, but by the blood of Jesus. And this day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. So this is going to be a celebratory feast throughout your generations as a statute forever. You shall keep it as a feast. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. So here we see him introducing the seven days following the Passover. So this would be the 14th day through the 21st day. This would be called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. Now, this translates to shall be executed as seen in Genesis chapter 17. So does it mean that they will be put to death? It could mean that, but it could also mean just simply separating them from the people of Israel or from the assembly. Now, typically when we look at leaven in the Bible, we will liken it to sin, but that is not the case for the unleavened bread here. The unleavened bread is actually symbolic of the fact that they have to leave so quickly that they cannot allow for the bread to rise. On the first day, you shall hold a holy assembly, and on the seventh day, a holy assembly. So notice that the Feast of Unleavened Bread will be sandwiched between two gatherings, two holy days. No work shall be done on those days, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your host out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. In the first month, from the fourteenth day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native of the land. You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread." Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the intel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. So the basin would have been the bucket that they would use to be able to wash the feet of those who were coming into their home. But tonight it is filled with the blood and it would be at the foot of of the door. And they would take this hyssop, which hyssop is symbolic of humility, and they would dip the blood and put it on the two sides of the doorpost and also on the intel, which is at the top. And when we look at that, you cannot help but see the cross in that, where it was at the top, the two sides, and the basin resting on the bottom. None of you shall go out of the door of this house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you... 
as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. So God has instated the Passover feast, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He is letting them know this is going to happen tonight, but I also need you to do this in all of the years to come. And now we've come to the point where the plague is actually going to take place. So verse 29, at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on his throne, to the firstborn of the captive, who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So this is not only a strike to the people, but also to their economy. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where someone was not dead. Then he summoned Moses and Aaron by night and said, up, go out from among my people, both you and the people of Israel and go serve the Lord as you have said, take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone and bless me also. And I'm like, man, is it not like Pharaoh to send them away and still be thinking about himself? Verse 33, the Egyptians were urgent with the people to send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened. So here we see the symbolism of the unleavened bread, their kneading bowls being bound up in their cloaks on their shoulders. The people of Israel had also done as Moses told them, for they had asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and for clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have what they asked. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So here we see everything playing out exactly as God had spoken it would. Verse 37, and the people of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth. Remember, Succoth is tent town and 600,000 men on foot besides women and children. So the fact that this was 600,000 men tells us that there was probably two to three million people, including the women and children. A mixed multitude also went up with them. So this could have been a mix of Egyptians and surrounding nations and very much livestock, both flocks and herds. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough that they had brought out of Egypt, for it was not leavened because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not wait, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. This is important to note here because of the fact that they are now going to be wandering in the desert for 40 years without provisions. So God will be their provision. He will supply their very needs. Now, the time that the people of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. At the end of the 430 years on that very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It was a night of watching by the Lord to bring them out of the land of Egypt. So this same night is a night of watching kept by the Lord by all the people of Israel throughout their generations. So this evening, this watching would be a night of solemn observance or solemn remembrance. So here in verse 43, we will see the regulations being put into place of the Passover. And we'll see even more details in the book of Leviticus, but for now, here are the ones he's putting into place. Verse 43, and the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the statute of the Passover. No foreigner shall eat of it, but every slave that is bought for money may eat of it after you have circumcised him. So in other words, anybody who's just passing through, who's not an Israelite and not willing to become one by becoming circumcised, cannot take part in the Passover meal. You have to be an Israelite. So everybody's welcome as long as you're willing to come to the faith. No foreigner or hired worker may eat of it. It shall be eaten in one house. You shall not take any of the flesh outside the house, and you shall not break any of its bones. Of course, this foreshadowing the death of Jesus and the fact that none of his bones will be broken. Now, when we look further into the symbolism of the bones, why did the bones not get broken? Why didn't God want Jesus's bones to be broken? Well, it could have been the fact that within the bones is where the blood supply comes from. And so, without breaking the bones, that goes to show that there is an endless supply of the blood of Jesus to be poured out on all who are willing to come. 
Verse 47, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. If a stranger shall sojourn with you and would keep the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised. So there it is saying that anyone who comes and is willing to be circumcised can partake in it. Then he may come near and keep it. He shall be as a native in the land, but no uncircumcised person shall eat of it. There shall be one law for the native and for the stranger who sojourns among you. So this one law will envelop both the Israelites and the foreigners who come to the faith. But the biggest thing is that faith is what is required here. All the people of Israel did just as the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that very day, the Lord brought the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. And reading this story for the first time can really paint such an ugly picture of who God is and can really make you think that He is such a cruel God to do this. But we've got to remember that God warned Pharaoh that this would happen. He told him, if you don't let my firstborn go, which means Israel, then I'm going to deal with your firstborn. And God gave him chance after chance to repent and to make it right, but he didn't. He gave him so much mercy. And in the end, we see that God continues to spare the Israelites. And our human thinking would actually assume that it's because they're somehow more worthy or maybe even more loved. But when we see how they act later, and knowing that God can foresee this, it simply can't be the case. You see, God is sparing them because He's sovereign, not because they're righteous or blameless. It's because they're His chosen people, just as we are the chosen ones today. And none of us deserve the grace and the mercy that He gives to us, yet here we are. So let's take a look at some deep dive questions. How do the plagues illustrate God's relationship with His people? What does shallow repentance look like? And what are the consequences of it? How can we reconcile God's divine plan and human desires? Why did God spare the Israelites? Read Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 5 through 9, and see if your answer remains the same. What might the greater purpose of the silver and gold articles be? And what relevance does the Passover hold for us today? So, Heavenly Father, we see today that your power is unrivaled in all the earth and beyond. I pray, God, that we never become so blinded with pride that we fail to recognize that. Forgive us, Lord, where we have done so. And we thank you for your unrelenting mercy and your continued commitment to set your people free. We know that there may be times whenever people or circumstances of life will try to hinder our worship. So I pray that we will be a people who have a persistent faith, refusing to give in and continuing to press in toward you. Where we may have fallen short of this, Lord, we ask your forgiveness and get ourselves up again so we can move forward instead of staying stuck. Where darkness is engulfing the lives of people today, God, we plead for your supernatural and divine presence to flood their homes. Don't allow the darkness of the enemy through depression or hard times hold them captive. Take the blinders off their eyes so that they can see you, at least just enough, Lord, to grab onto your hand and to be pulled out. We see the power of intercession and praying for others, so we trust that you hear our cries today. You know the names of the ones that are written on our hearts. Oh God, set them free, and may they live out the rest of their lives in worship to you. Thank you, Lord, for your divine favor on our lives. We know and we trust fully in your sovereignty, knowing that even though we may not deserve it, you still give us more than we could ever expect to receive. It may not happen on this side of eternity, but we'll put our hope and trust in knowing that you are a good father who desires to give to his children. We don't place our value in what man gives to us, but we simply put our value in who we are in you, knowing that we have already been given so much by way of your undeserved grace. And we know that you are just, so we rest in that today. And we thank you for delivering us from our own personal Egypts, where we were once held down by the slavery of sin or the yoke of trying to do things on our own or the weight that this world would bear down upon us. You, Jesus, the spotless lamb, the ultimate sacrifice, laid down your life so that we could be spared judgment. Just as the Passover was instated to celebrate this newfound freedom, I pray that we never make it become something that is so watered down by societal norms of a holiday. May we understand the sanctity and the divinity of the amazing miracle of your death and resurrection. 
We know that your providence was not just a one-time thing for just a generation of people, but that it continues to watch over us today as well. And we are so grateful for it. So we thank you, Father. We love you so much and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death and every single one of us have fallen short. And then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I wanna be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm gonna end up after I die but I don't wanna live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're gonna say a prayer and I'm gonna put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're gonna say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name, amen.